Thank you all very much for this one minute of silence in honor of Professor Dijalma. It is a great, great pleasure for us to have today Professor Daniel Gianola uh, from University of Wisconsin Medicine. He's going to talk to us in this 10th round of the ABE COVID-19 Ações e Desafios webinar series on the statistical aspects of the COVID-19 epidemic in Uruguay in both in a regional and world context. Uh, for those of you if, you, if you guys know of anyone having problems to connect to this Zoom room, uh, please just share the word that we are broadcasting this through our channel on YouTube at ABE e COVID-19 channel, okay? Professor Gianola, thank you so much for accepting our invitation. Uh, Beatriz Cuyabano, thank you very much for intermediating this and making this happen as well. Professor Gianola, uh, you should be able to share your screen at this point if you are willing to uh, do a visual presentation. Um, and thank you, thank you very much. This is probably one of the most international webinars that we had uh, up to now. I, I'm seeing people from Mexico, US, Germany, uh, and of course, Brazil, and I'm pretty sure there are uh, 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 attendants from other locations as well. Thank you very much. Let's see, uh, um, am I sharing my screen now? Uh, let's see, not yet. Um, let's see, uh, I have to press share screen, right? Yes, and then you should have uh, to choose what application you're going to share from. Is that multiple? Well, uh, let's see. Uh, do you see that? Do you see the PowerPoint? Uh, not yet. Yes, I not see. Well, not mm. for me. Uh, can anyone confirm? Because my screen is only on the video. How about now? Yes, perfect. Yeah. Now, okay. now we can see it. Perfect. OK, well, um, First, uh, I will uh, say uh, uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for this invitation to speak with the Brazilian Society of Statistics. Um, I, as Benelton said, I work at the University of Wisconsin, Madison, where I'm now a professor emeritus. Uh, my background is not in statistics, is not in epidemiology, is not in medicine. I'm an agricultural scientist and I have worked uh, most of my life with the genetic improvement of uh, live animals. And more recently, I have done some work uh, with uh, plant breeding as well. Uh, let me show you a little bit uh, the Madison environment. These are photos. Uh, here we have what is called the Isthmus. Uh, Madison is the capital of the state of Wisconsin. So here we have the Congress. Uh, there are two lakes. The campus of the University of Wisconsin is in the southern shore of this lake. Here you have a, a view of the campus. And to the right, uh, it's a photo, aerial photo of the medical complex. Um, of course, like uh, most U.S. universities, we have an active sports program and a very active band. This is when uh, the University of Wisconsin this year played in Pasadena in California, the Rose Bowl, American football. We didn't do too well, uh, but anyhow, we have a great marching band. This is a photo of the Memorial Union Terrace. Uh, where students and professors and citizens of Madison enjoy in the summer to have beer and to eat and to dance when weather permits. And Wisconsin is notoriously cold. We have a very long and harsh winter, as Professor Mariana Muta knows very well. So these are photos of students playing with snow. It's really long winter. Um, my, my work, uh, just to give you an idea of where I'm coming from, uh, at the moment focuses on using molecular data to predict 
complex traits in animals and plants, sometimes with uh, some collaborations in human genetics. Uh, you are all familiar with the double helix with these variants called SMPs. And the idea is to associate uh, genomic regions to uh, traits of agricultural importance, what we call complex traits, and also to build the uh, prediction machines. To do this, we use uh, statistical methods. Uh, best linear bias prediction is the most widely used prediction tool in animal and plant breeding. It was developed by Professor Charles Henderson. Uh, I spent a year with him at Cornell, and then he joined me as a colleague when I was at the University of Illinois. That photo was taken in 1987 when uh, Henderson and I taught together a course on variance component estimation. And some of you may uh, perhaps uh, have not read papers from Henderson because he mostly concentrated on breeding, but he had some students that popularized his ideas and tried to make them clear to the public. Uh, one was Professor Shale Searle. Uh, his linear models book is a classic in statistics. And to the right, we have Professor Dale Van Vleck. He uh, is uh, now a retired professor at the University of Nebraska, but did most of his career at Cornell. And uh, best linear bias prediction uh, is used in animal and plant breeding because it makes sense. It can be linked to uh, Mendelian theory in a very nice, nice manner. But then it's also because he has some well-known statistical properties. Like for example, he's a Bayesian conditional posterior expectation. He's a penalized maximum likely estimator. He's related to Krieging in geostatistics, a special case of reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces regression, and also a linear neural network with a linear activation function when the pedigrees are used as nodes or in, in, in the network. It's so wide, it has so many nice properties that Andrew Gelman, who statistician known quite well, one say one day he stated that it was like the Holy Roman Empire. Um, we all have been also using Bayesian methods. Actually, we introduced Bayesian methods in animal breeding in the early 80s with my colleague Rojo Fernando. And of course, we have not escaped the area of machine learning and artificial intelligence. And we have adapted reproducing current vivid spaces regression and neural networks to the needs of animal and, and plant breeding. But I'm not going to talk about that today. Uh, I'm going to talk about disease, especially pandemics and zoonosis. Um, looking back into the past, we all heard about the plague uh, there is a book by the author of Robinson Crusoe, where he has a detailed journal of what happened in London uh, in the 1600s. Uh, you may also uh, have heard about the famous Spanish flu that killed millions of persons in around 1919. And of course, if you like literature, you probably read The Plague by Albert Camus, which of course was a fiction, but if you read again, uh, you'll be able to associate many of the experiences that we have had recently to statements made in, in that book, that it, is, it was a fictional epidemic, but uh, it relates very much to what we have been doing now. Now, uh, something that perhaps we have not appreciated very much that we have lived in a world with epidemics all the time. And COVID-19 is not the only epidemic that we're having at the moment. Actually, there are many diseases. Here is a list from the World Health Organization, including the famous Middle Eastern Respiratory Virus, the SARS virus, also respiratory disease, and many other ones that you are familiar to various extents. So uh, it's not surprising that uh, we're going to have another disease, a new disease. And um, if you know Gabriel Garcia Marquez, a Nobel Prize of Literature, he has this book in Spanish, Crónica de una Muerte Anunciada. Well, we could replace uh, a death 
by epidemics. So uh, this was this is going to be a chronicle de una epidemia anunciada, the chronic of an already announced epidemic. Uh, in the right, we have a photo of the Ying Ying Tan Hospital in Wuhan, China. Wuhan is a city of 11 million persons. And the photo below is the train station in Wuhan. Uh, in 2008, they inaugurated bullet trains from Wuhan to Guangzhou via Beijing. Uh, I have been to China many times. The first time was in 1980. And in these 40 years, uh, China has experimented extraordinary changes. On December 30 last year, a patient with a strange type of pneumonia showed up at the Wuhan Medical Treatment Center. And uh, a reverse transcript phase, which is here, is a test in which the RNA, the ribonucleic acid of the virus, is converted into cDNA and then is amplified using a, a reaction called polymer exchange reaction that makes multiple copies and facilitates working with samples, diagnosed that it was a, a new virus, a new type of coronavirus. The doctor uh, that dealt with these patients immediately informed colleagues in China through WeChat. WeChat is a Chinese application similar to WhatsApp. And as soon as he informed, he was detained uh, by the police and was forced to sign a statement saying that he was not going to give more information without authorization. This is not surprising. Uh, China is an authoritarian uh, regime uh, and the information flow is typically restricted. On December 31st, uh, a health alert was issued in Wuhan and all of the patients that showed up in the hospitals that need to be hospitalized, they had all visited uh, a market, a seafood and live animal market, where uh, you find animals like civets, that are cat type animals, and pangolins, a little bit like armadillos, that many people in China consume. And the, the speculation is that uh, these animals have been infected with the virus coming from bats, which are very, very, very common in many areas of the world, including Brazil. Um, this is a schematic of how the virus enters into cells. Uh, you have perhaps have seen these schematics of the virus form and have these famous spikes. And that spike has an area called the receptor binding domain that links with a docking station called the angiotensin converting enzyme to receptor. And then once this connection is established, the viral RNA, which is this light blue here, enters into the cells and the virus start replicated into the organisms. So this is a more detailed uh, uh, diagram where the, the receptor uh, binding domain uh, of the COVID-2, which is the one that, I'm sorry, the SARS-2, which is the one that produces COVID-19, is compared with the coronavirus that produces the SAR sy sy uh, syndrome. And uh, uh, the, the differences are here. Uh, this is fully consistent with uh, what's known molecular evolution, evolution of viruses, but these tiny changes can produce uh, drastic modifications in the behavior of the virus in an epidemic. Uh, as you know, uh, the symptoms of COVID-19 are Manifold. Uh, typically, the patients present themselves coughing, sneezing, um, and it can be transmitted through, through close personal contact, uh, through conversation, chanting, hugging, kissing, touching, and you can also touch objects or surfaces. And unless you wash your hands or disinfect, and then you take touch your eyes or mouth you can get the virus. It can be uh, transmitted through fecal contamination, 
And now there is a big discussion as to whether it's transmitted by aerosols. There seems to be some evidence that, that it does. Uh, once uh, the, the virus uh, infects a person, uh, there is fever, there is cough, uh, there are gastrointestinal problems, but then there are cases in which uh, the presentation is very severe, uh, including kidney failure, death, severe pneumonias, and also very strong reactions of the immune system called cytokine storms. Uh, the cytokines are uh, part of the natural killer cells of the immune system, and it happens that the virus, the virus in some patients, uh, produces an oral reaction of the immune system uh, with a release of cytokines, and this produces tremendous inflammation in patients that uh, lead to death. Uh, as you have probably read, uh, there was a study, uh, I believe in Britain, that showed that a very mundane uh, corticoid dexamethasone can be used uh, sometimes effectively to control the inflammation. But it's a very serious disease in some people, not in all. Let me continue with the saga. On January 1st, remember that the case, the first patient showed to the hospital on December 30. Two days later, Beijing informed the World Health Organization if you do not know, it's a, it's a UN organization based in Geneva. United States, China, Japan, and Germany are the biggest funding, uh, the big, biggest donors. And uh, the WHO immediately set up an, is something called an incident management support team to investigate the situation. Uh, on January 3rd, 44 new cases appeared in China. And in January 4th, the World Health Organization tweeted and wrote, China has reported to WHO a cluster of pneumonia cases with no death so far in Wuhan, Hubei province. Investigations are underway to identify the cause of the illness. On January 12th, the Chinese scientists published a paper publicly, this was 12, 13 days after the first patient showed up uh, with the entire sequence of the genome of the virus, 30,000 letters. This is remarkable because it shows several things. It shows how much science has advanced in China and how much science has been globalized. Two weeks after the first case, we knew the genomic sequence of of the virus. Um, on January 13, there was a report of the first case of this disease outside of China. It was in Thailand, a person that was hospitalized on January 8. And then at the end of the month, on January 28, the WHO issued what is called a public health emergency of international concerns. And if you look at the time from, uh, let's say, January 1st to January 28th, it's 27 days. And the reason for that delay is that if you are familiar with international organizations like the World Bank, where I spent three years of my life, uh, there are very strict regulations on how to proceed, how to move from one stage of reporting to another. There has to be an agreement with committees. So uh, this period of time it, in, in, the, in that particular context is not unusually long. So at any rate, um, if the World Health Organization incurred in, let's say, in an unusual delay, this will be clarified after some international investigation is done. But uh, I don't think there are reasons to believe uh, that uh, the delay is uh, important relative to what happened after in many countries. But there have been real failures in controlling the disease by various governments. This is a photo of the Wuhan International Airport. Uh, it's, uh, Wuhan with 11 million is considered to be a small city in China, but it's connected internationally to Canada, France, Italy, USA, Russia, New Zealand, Japan, 
Israel, Netherlands, Korea, Australia, Germany, Philippines, Singapore, USA, Vietnam. So uh, the virus could escape to this large airport that is very well connected. And uh, subsequently, the routes of transmission to Europe and to North America were established. There were two routes of transmission which are dotted uh, one from uh, Wuhan, Wuhan is in the Hubei province, from Wuhan to Seattle uh, on January 15. That was essentially blocked. That did not result in additional infections. And likewise, uh, from Shanghai to Munich on January 19, there was another route that was also blocked because there were no subsequent infections, at least as per the epidemiological, tra epidemiological uh, tracing practice. So uh, uh, using modern methods of reconstruction, it was established uh, that the first case that led to the epidemic in North America was in Seattle, February 13, and then in Europe, on February the 20th. So that, let's say, this is the official start of the epidemic in the Western world. Uh, I took this yesterday from the, if you see here below, August 5th uh, at 1.34 p.m. Central Standard Times. Um, or at that time, there have been uh, close to 19 million cases in the world with about 700,000 persons, persons dying. Uh, the United States is the largest epidemic by far with close to 5 million cases followed by Brazil, by Brazil, India, Russia, and South Africa. And the US has already had about 158,000 deaths. So the US represents 4% of the population, but 25% of the cases with 4 million. So a substantial proportion of death as well. Uh, this, uh, this is a world map uh, trying to indicate the density of the epidemics as of August 5th. And you see that it's widely widespread with variations in density that depend on many factors, including demographic uh, density, um, and level of development, which of course impinges on the on the level of testing. Uh, let me show uh, the largest epidemics, uh, and I would like to contrast primarily the USA, Brazil, India, Russia, South Africa, Mexico, and Iran, where, for example, in the US, the epidemic uh, started in the East Coast in New York, and it was gradually being reduced actually quite successfully in New York when roughly out of in early June uh, due to the fact that the United States is uh, we are having elections this year uh, there was a premature reopening of many economies especially in some states with a, a huge increase in number of cases subsequently the situation got very, very serious. And now after considerable discussion, the, the executive power has recognized that uh, wearing a mask and doing some basic things like social distances are crucial to keeping this virus at bay. I'm not going to comment very much uh, about the Brazilian situation, except that it's very serious, especially when you look at it in, in terms of number of cases Per 100,000 inhabitants, Brazil has about 30 number, 30 cases, US 20 cases, India has about four cases, uh, Russia about eight, four, um, and then South Africa and Mexico are also in pretty bad shape. Iran also is, uh, is, is in, in bad shape, but unfortunately I do not know much about the situation of the epidemics, uh, so I, I'm not very, cognizant of, I, I'm very ignorant about, about Iran. In, in European countries, uh, Germany, France, Italy, Spain, the epidemic and the United Kingdom, the epidemic was quite severe. Um, Germany, France, Italy, and Spain introduced rather uh, the varied in degree, but fairly severe lockdowns. 
but they were quite successful in reducing the number of cases and keeping the epidemics under control such that it would not crash, at least at the moment, the hospital system, which unfortunately happened in Italy, in the northern part in Lombardia, uh, where the scenes of, of uh, people dying in the hospital was pathetic. That was one of the big concerns that the medical community had, that in the absence of severe uh, disease contention measures, uh, there will be a possibility that the hospital system will be crashed. Uh, Spain also underwent um, a very severe epidemic, then things are substantially better, uh, but now we have had outbreaks in Catalonia and Aragon, and the, the, there was an outbreak in Galicia uh, more recently. So the situation in Spain is, uh, is deteriorating, whereas in Italy it seems to be maintained under control with less than one case per 100,000 inhabitants at the moment. The United Kingdom is, uh, is an interesting story. Well, interesting in some respects, because they first started with a policy of laxity, but then the situation changed. And I will talk about more about that a little bit more later. Uh, in this um, uh, slide, uh, I want to uh, point out the red stars, which are successful stories. And then the yellow stars, which is uh, an interesting comment that I will make, and then the case of Australia. Let me start with Australia first. Australia was highly successful in keeping the virus at bay, but then uh, in Melbourne, in Victoria, there has been a, a very severe increase in numbers. So now uh, the situation in Australia is a, is a serious one again. Uh, New Zealand has been the subject of much international discussions. They, uh, uh, a great deal of the press has speculated about the competence of uh, premiers that are from the that are, that are women. And, and uh, Hacinda Ardern is the prime minister of, of New Zealand. She has become a bit of a rock star. Actually, New Zealand was many, many days without no cases whatsoever, but they have some some cases thereafter, but the situation is um, it's an under control. And New Zealand is a high, highly advanced country from a technological perspective. And the, the Kiwis, as they are called, they are very, very practical. Taiwan was a, another tremendous success in which the number of cases per capita was kept at very low and the life in Taiwan is normal. And Korea, uh, the, the outbreaks came up essentially from religious congregation in Daewoo in the southern part of Korea, if I am correct. And then with an extensive system of testing, testing and tracing, the virus have been kept to manageable levels. Now I'll talk about the three yellow stars, Thailand, Vietnam, and Myanmar. And if you look especially Vietnam and Myanmar, the number of cases per capita is incredibly low. Actually, in Vietnam, there have been no death whatsoever, even though in recent days, there has been an increasing number of cases in the coastal city of Da Nang, where there are beaches and the Vietnamese are going there to swim, uh, but the number of cases per capita is very low. And there is a conjecture that perhaps in Southeast Asia, there is an acquired cross immunity to COVID-19 because that area is populated by many, many different types of coronaviruses, which perhaps have produced uh, cross immunity for the COVID-19. But that's still an area under discussion. There is much, much, much that scientists still do not know about the virus. Now enter into Latin America. Uh, these data are from the European Center for Disease Control and Prevention, so the dates may differ slightly from what the official dates are in your respective countries. Uh, all Latin American countries invariably are having a really hard time. I will already talk about Brazil, but Argentina, Bolivia, Peru, Mexico, and Chile have had very serious epidemics. 
in Chile, the situation seems to be gradually getting under control. In Venezuela, we don't know very much about what is going on, but the news that we receive are not good, and the data are suggestive that the situation is not good either. But there are two countries, Uruguay, Uruguay, and Cuba, where the number of cases has been very low on a per capita basis. In Uruguay, it has never exceeded one case per 100,000 inhabitants, and in Cuba has never exceeded 0.6 cases per 100,000 inhabitants. These two countries are very different from each other. Uh, one is an authoritarian regime. Uruguay is a vibrant democracy. Uh, perhaps what they have the sharing common apart from language, humor, and other and love for music uh, is that they both have strong public health systems. So this is perhaps a reason that creates similarities because between Cuba and Uruguay, because it's hard to think about other similarities. Uh, the Uruguayans are more quiet and sadder, the Cubans are exuberant, the Cubans dance salsa, the Uruguayans do not dance anything, well, let's say tango for the sake of arguments. But these are perhaps the two countries have been the only two countries successful in, uh, in Latin America in keeping the virus at the manageable level. Chile is making good progress, but the rest of the countries are really in bad shape. Uh, in order to find cases, you have to test. And there is an enormous variation in testing rates. The data here uh, are number of tests conducted per new confirmed cases of COVID-19. So you perhaps have heard the president of the United States saying that uh, the United States has the most extensive and best testing system in the world. Well, uh, if you compare even tiny countries like uh, Uruguay and Taiwan, uh, I'm going to say Ireland is not a tiny country, Uganda, a poor country, they have done a much, much better job in terms of testing intensiveness, which is in the absence of a vaccine, is a crucial element in the implementation of containment strategies for the population. How about death rates? Well, um, this uh, shows what is called the case fatality rates, is the number of deaths divided by the number of cases confirmed and as you can see here, there are countries in Europe like France and Italy and Spain that have had uh, fairly large death rates, uh, sometimes exceeding 15% uh, relative to cases confirmed. Whereas other countries like Norway, Uruguay and Cuba have had much lower rates. So there's a tremendous amount of variation among countries. The United States has uh, done a, a relatively good job in, in keeping death below. That perhaps reflects uh, the, how the disease has been managed, especially in serious cases. Now, not everybody is at the same risks. Uh, this data is from, um, from the United Kingdom, from Wales, Scotland, and England, where uh, the main risk factors, if you get COVID-19, the main risk factors for death are age, the older you get, the, the higher the chances are that a person will die. Uh, males are at higher risk, risk than females. Uh, and also, if a patient has um, comorbidities such as cardiac, pulmonary, kidney problems, di diabetes, and obesity, uh, you are at higher risk of death. Of course, if you are immunosuppressed, like it happens when people undergo uh, cancer treatment that adds a risk, but it's, it's not a blanket statement. For example, there are some patients uh, that have lymphomas that are treated with um, a medication called BTKs, uh, Bruton uh, thyroid kinase inhibitors, that actually seems to confer some protection to those patients. So it's a uh, it, 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 there are always ifs and buts and considerations when one talks about death rates and risks. Uh, I have put uh, here the 
evolution of the epidemics in number of cases in Uruguay for August 4 and Brazil. Uh, the numbers, of course, cannot be compared. Brazil has uh, more than 50,000 daily cases. Um, in Uruguay, the number of cases never exceeded 36. And uh, there has been really not the, the, the typical curve that you observe in epidemics. Like, uh, for example, in essentially completed epidemics, such as in Italy, the first the number of cases increases almost exponentially, then reaches a peak, and then comes down, and then has a long tail to the right. So the Uruguayan epidemic really uh, it cannot be characterized in that classical manner. Uh, this is a smoothing of the number of cases uh, doing with the local polynomials and a span parameter of 15%. Uh, essentially, uh, in Brazil, the epidemics has increased and continues increasing, although in recent days there is some, some encouraging signs, condition on the date, of course. Whereas in Uruguay, these uh, non-parametric treatments suggest that the epidemic has proceeded a bit like part of the Uruguayan territory. We have been there, we have slight undulations. Uh, so we have had uh, one, two, three, four, maybe five or six peaks during the epidemic. But essentially, we are now where we were before and sometimes better. We actually have uh, several days with, without no cases. OK, so this. Uh, an overall description of where we are uh, on a worldwide basis. So um, let me uh, walk you through some basic epidemiology and let me remind you that I'm not an epidemiologist. These are things that I try to teach myself and perhaps some of you have done likewise. So I'm going to uh, give the elements of the a basic epidemiological model, model called SIR susceptible, infected, and removed. The term removed means that you either recovered or dead. It doesn't matter. It's not distinguished. So uh, this is a model that can be characterized in terms of differential equations. But to, for the sake of a simple explanation, let me explain the following. Let's say that you're at day t plus 1 of the epidemic. The S, the susceptibles, the number of susceptible is decreased by the infections that occur and these infections are proportional to the percent infected to the percent to be infected and of a parameter called the transmission rate so if you decrease the susceptibles that means that you increase the infected and the way that you increase the infected is uh, from this term which is that one minus those that are removed because they are either recovered from the infection because they have died so this model assumes a constant population size, and there are two parameters, beta and gamma, uh, that drive the dynamics of, of the process. Now, if you consider uh, the difference between the number of infections at day t plus 1 and day t, this can be shown to be the beta parameter times the fraction of susceptibles minus gamma. And uh, at very early stages of the epidemic, the number of susceptibles is approximately equal to the number in the population. So if you set this ratio to one, then you have the condition of that for the epidemic to grow, beta has to be larger than gamma, the transmission rate has to be larger than the recovery rate. And this ratio is the famous R coefficient, is the reproducing number of the virus which can be shown to be the average number of infections produced by infector. Now, at some point, the epidemic proceeds and reaches equilibrium. That's when the number of cases at day t is equal to the number of cases at, at day t uh, minus 1. And at that point, it can be shown that there is a relationship between r and the percent of infection at equilibrium, which is called the herd immunity. And at this point, the population acts as if you have been vaccinated. That means that uh, the virus cannot make additional progress and, and the epidemic starts going down. So it can be shown that the, uh, the population uh, that is infected at equilibrium 
is one minus the reciprocal of R, where R has to be estimated at early stage of the epidemic. So R is very large. A large proportion of the population needs to be infected to reach herd immunity. If R is small, then the population is, is, the, is small as well. The percentage is small as well. So uh, these are two hypothetical situations uh, for the Uruguayan uh, uh, <clears throat> scenery. Uh, we have about a 3.47 million populations. If you assume that R is 2.5 at the onset and you let the epidemic progress without doing absolutely nothing, uh, the number of cases varies according to this red curve. It reaches a maximum and then declines gradually. And this is, uh, if you don't do anything, it is what it is. So what happens if you don't do anything? Well, the number of cases increases very fast and you reach a point in which, in which there are so many patients that need to be, go to a hospital that the hospital doesn't have any capacity and they have to start doing tents or opening stadiums uh, or convention centers and put the patients there. On the other hand, if you don't have a vaccine, uh, you can instruct the population to take distance uh, from others and not to congregate, use uh, facial masks to uh, reduce the probability of transmission. Uh, that's imp especially important because uh, COVID-19 is asymptomatic. So sometimes you're okay, but you are shedding the virus. So if you do something, let's say if you reduce the RO from 2.5, to 1.2, which is still a bad number because it means that the epidemic is growing, then the time to peak is delayed from about 225 to 300 days. And the number of infections at peak comes down from about 14, 1,500 to 600. So you help the hospital system by doing what we have all heard, by flattening the curve. This is really, really basic. With basic measures, it is possible to flatten the curve. And depending on how aggressive you are with these measures, the more effective you will be. Now we are going to switch to a more technical matter and talk about estimation of the viral reproduction number. So essentially, suppose uh, you have an infected person, that person is exposed to five random persons. If three get contacted, you say that there are three infections per infector, and that's called an attack rate of 60%. If that person infects two, the R is two. If a person infects five, R is five. The diseases vary uh, much in terms of this uh, reproduction number, but the reproduction number is not only intrinsic to the virus, it's also dependent on what sort of social measures are taken, okay? The, the, the environment, and there are many factors. But measles, for example, is extremely contagious, has an R over 14. And here you have the first SARS, cov one with um, a row a little bit over 2.5, and SARS-CoV-2, which is COVID-19, about 2.3, 2.4. And here you have other viruses like smallpox, Middle Eastern respiratory disease that are even more contagious than, um, than COVID, than SARS-CoV-2. So if let's say that the R is equal to three, if one infect, person infected three and that person infected three, at the end of three cycles of infection, you have 40 infected persons. So it really, really spreads dangerously and fast. Now, when uh, th this is a schematic of what happens, the epidemic starts here. Let's say you have an index case, typically it's a one, uh, and that index case generates infections that are distributed over time. So here, for the sake of explanation, uh, we are distributing over three subsequent days. So then the, the number of uh, cases that occur at day one, they spread over the three following days and so on, okay? This is just as a matter. Now, the, the logic of the transmission, you can spread one, two, three, four, five, 10, 20, 
depends is intrinsic to the virus. And in the case of, uh, of COVID, uh, in the case of COVID-19, uh, there is some evidence that the, what is called the serial interval of the virus, which is the probability distribution of the time between symptoms appears in an infector and an infected person can be described with a log normal or wibble distribution and the probabilities of infections in days two, three, four, five, and six after exposure, uh, after the person has been infected is that when the symptoms appear, uh, is, those are the days in which there is a higher chance. Uh, the Imperial College about seven years ago developed a, a useful software called EPSTIM, which I have used to do some quantitative analysis of the Uruguayan epidemics. The basic idea is here, you have a series of cases from the beginning to time T, and then the model proposes that conditionally uh, on previous infections and on a vector of probabilities that depend on the serial interval of the virus, there is a Poisson distribution that is governed by uh, the product with a parameter as the product of the wire T that's called the viral reproduction number of times T times an index of infection, which is a weighted average of the previous infections, okay? So these Ws are numbers between zero and one. If you go from one to infinity, the W is something like. And then uh, uh, this um, approach uses a, a Bayesian uh, framework, which is uh, nice because the Poisson distribution conjugates with uh, gamma prior uh, with hyperparameters A and B, and then you obtain a Poisson posterior. So uh, what you need here, uh, apart from the number of cases, is elements of the vector Ws. And uh, you, what you do with this program, there are many different ways of estimating Ws. But if you introduce the information COVID from the Japanese paper, well, the first author was Japanese, Nishura, with a mean and standard deviation, the program will generate you the, the values of W1, W2, Ws, which then are used to come up with this infection index. So uh, then you can dynamically estimate RT in the course of the epidemics. So if let's say from now until for a period of tau days, the characteristics of the infection process remain constant, you can assume that uh, uh, the probability that, that the new infections are mutually independent, conditionally on W, conditionally on the previous infections, uh, according to Poisson. And then you combine this Poisson with this prior, uh, with A and B uh, elicited in some arbitrary manner. And then you have a conjugacy, and the posterior is gamma, with the parameters updated from A to um, a plus the number of infections during this period and parameter B and, and the second parameter B plus the number of indexes plus the value of the indexes sum over this period. Uh, of course, there are many different ways of parameterizing the gamma distribution. So I use the parameterization in terms of shape and rate. And with that one, uh, it, uh, the posterior expectation is A plus the number of infections during that period divided by B plus the sum of the indexes during that period. So it's, it's a bit like an average as, as you would expect it to be, the average number of infections per infector. And this is the variance. Okay, uh, something that the program doesn't do, but any uh, person that knows elementary base analysis knows that it's easy to do, is to construct a predictive distribution. And the way you, uh, you arrive at the predictive distribution uh, is you have the prior at times t, then you postulate a, a probability distribution with which future observations are going to be generated. So here we use a Poisson as in the past. And then you treat these future observations as missing data. And you can either use uh, 
composition sampling or direct sampling if the if the if the distributions are friendly, as it is the case, or in a more advanced Bayesian model, you can use Markov chain Monte Carlo. So it's very easy to draw samples from the predictive distribution by using composition sampling. So you uh, you start drawing the the future observations, you update the are the posterior of R, but now using this missing data and so on. And at the end, you have the draws from the predictive distribution. So let me remind you the Uruguayan epidemics. We are going to apply these to Uruguay. Uh, these are the number of cases. Um, there are some landmarks. Uh, this, this, I did this. Uh, in early June, so I have not updated it, but it suffices to illustrate the procedure. The first uh, outbreak in Uruguay came from a wedding, a big wedding with several hundred uh, guests. They were dancing the whole night, but some of the guests uh, had just returned from Europe and they it was super spreading event. Then there was a second uh, spread in a psychiatric institution uh, I, I, this is to remind you of the psychi psychiatric institution by uh, reference to Jack Nicholson's film, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. I know that you, some of you are very, very young, but that was a brilliant film by Jack Nicholson. Then uh, there were some residentials. Uh, people were old persons live. And uh, unfortunately, in Uruguay, we have many residentials that are below standards. So there was another outbreak. And then we had an outbreak in the border with Brazil in a department called Rivera. And you do not recognize this person. He's a, he's a former Uruguayan football player called Pablo Bengochea, but he comes from that part of the country and he has a very distinctive accent. Uh, the people from Rivera are easy to recognize because they speak a little bit with a Brazilian intonation. So these are the medians of the posterior distribution uh, on a daily basis, uh, starting from day eight of the epidemic. So Uruguay started with a 2.6. Uh, of course, the prior is influential at the time and the APS team has a, an implicit prior of five uh, for the prior mean of, of R. Then gradually R decrease. Uh, it got below one, which is good because it meant that the epidemic was decreasing, but then we have these outbreaks and R has came back again and then came down and came back, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that has been essentially the, the history of the Rwandan epidemics, uh, up and down, up and down with a great deal of statistical uncertainty because of the low number of cases. And now I'm going to uh, select uh, arbitrarily these 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, and 80 to uh, show you what the inferences would be at that time using the full Bayesian approach, followed by the, an evaluation of the prediction machine. So these are the posterior distributions of R for day 10, which was over 1.5, day 20, day 30 in blue, 40 in green, 50 magenta, 60 in black, 70 here, and 80 in the dashed line. So the, the, there is a lot of uh, uncertainty about the values of R, but also there is a great deal of sensitivity because of the low number of cases. But this is uh, uh, something that is very easy to do, and uh, it conveys the full uncertainty uh, in the typical Bayesian manner. Now, how about the predictions? Well, from the predictive distribution, I can compute the probability of observing um, uh, from zero to whatever number of cases for the following day. And I have been doing these calculations on a daily basis. So this is the full predictive distribution. Uh, the above the dotted line, are a number of cases with more than 1% probability. And then, uh, of course, uh, we can more or less see whether it's appreciable probability. I come up with a forecast for the expected number of cases for that day, the most likely value, and the median distribution. And we did this for day 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, and 80. Okay. Now, 
Uh, these are one day forward predictions. So of course, you can go two day forward, three day forward, four day forward, five day forward, but because of the uh, statistical volatility of the Rwandan epidemics, fortunately, um, it, it's a bit dangerous to go beyond one day. So how did we evaluate the quality of the prediction? Well, um, we could have compared with another prediction machine, which I didn't do, but I decided to compare it against the worst possible prediction machine, okay? Which is chaos. Uh, if you uh, watch Netflix, this is an Israeli series called Fauda. I found it quite entertaining. Uh, I think uh, the third season was just over. A lot of Middle Eastern stuff but it's, it's interesting. And it helps, and it helps to some extent to understand the situation uh, in that part of the world. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Okay, so how, what did we do? Well, what I did is I created random epidemics, which I introduced the term randemia. Uh, so if, let's say you have a 100 uh, days in the epidemic with a number of cases, and you shuffle them at random, there are 100 factorial possible uh, epidemics. I don't remember how many days the Uruguayan epidemic had at that time, but there were 2.11 times 10 to 132 possible randemias at that point. The logic is the following. Uh, suppose this is, Daisy, this is a, an amusement park in Uruguay, and this is a, a game called Gusano Loco, a uh, crazy world. It goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and you never know when it's going to go forward or backwards or when it's going to go stop. So if these are the number of cases, uh, the day zero, day one, day two, day 10, say, and you start moving them around, the viruses will rotate and they will change at random. So the cases, the number of cases will be reorganized at random. So you destroy the association between the temporal appearance of the number of cases. And then, so you get a completely random epidemic. So these uh, are four epidemics using a bar diagram for random epidemics. Remember that um, the, 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 at the beginning, we had a, an outbreak here. Well, if you see some of the random epidemics, uh, it's completely different. So these are, uh, then we use uh, APS team to find the posterior distribution, the red and the posterior medians of R of I'm speaking about. The green is a 97 and a half upper percentile. The blue is the lower 2.5% percentile of distribution. So these are three characterizations of the posterior distributions of four random epidemics. These are 2000 random epidemics. And you can see that at the beginning, uh, the R values tend to be larger simply because of the influence of the prior, but the prior gets uh, faded away fairly rapidly, at least a random epidemic. So I generated 2,000 randemias, and then I computed the distribution of the mean square of prediction of these random uh, epidemics uh, at days 10, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, et cetera, and compare with the actual prediction. So the, we have a single day, so the, what I'm doing is computing the prediction error and raising to the square to compare to the mean square error. So for day 10, the model for Uruguay predicted, uh, uh, the, the square prediction error was 841, so it didn't work too well for day 10 that was associated with the outbreak due to the social events. Uh, in day 20, uh, it moved to the left, so it was much better. Day 30, day 40, 50, 60, 70. So, sorry. So in, in general, uh, the, the, the model seemed to improve considerably relative to the random uh, chaotic randemia. Uh, so this is good news because this is a simple model. And perhaps it could be rendered more sophisticated by incorporating more granular information. But you have to keep in mind that the more complex the model is, the more 
chance, the higher the chance that something will go wrong. There is something to be done about simplicity. Simplicity and robustness tend to go hand by hand. Now, um, I'm going to use uh, these concepts to address uh, the herd immunity idea, which was a, a strategy that was adopted early in the game by the government of Britain and also with Sweden, except that in Sweden was not let it be uh, or it is what it is, uh, they tried to protect segments of the population that were at higher risk. Um, in Britain, they started with a lax attitude and they say, well, let's let everybody get exposed to the virus so we will develop herd immunity and we'll be better off in the, in the long term. Well, uh, as you probably know, Boris Johnson got into the hospital and uh, on or about that time, the government of Britain decided to stop with a herd immunity approach because uh, many people were getting sick, too many actually. Uh, in the US, uh, especially the media that uh, sympathize with the current government, uh, were showing all these photos of people in Sweden uh, going out to the parks, enjoying themselves, because that was a Swedish strategy, is to do herd immunity to let the virus spread itself, but especially among young people. Uh, but let's see, let's see what happened, okay? Now, not everybody in Sweden was happy with that approach, but this is an example uh, in Fox News, for example, most of the pundits, the, the people that make commentary politics were saying that uh, what the US was doing and what the Europeans were doing was nonsense, that we should let everybody get exposed to the virus and it will disappear in due time, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But not everybody in Sweden was happy with uh, using the herd immunity approach. And they argued that Sweden was going to pay a very high cost in terms of death. Now, uh, this is the bar diagram for the number of cases for Sweden. Uh, as you can see, Sweden at the moment has about 5,000 5 cases per 100,000 inhabitants, but it was much worse a few days ago. So in recent days, it has been a marked improvement. But previously, because of this, uh, let's say, call it pseudo herd immunity, the, the epidemic was progressing, 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 following a curve that was very different from the one for Italy, France, Spain, and notoriously Germany. So here um, we have a table that I made was in, using data for a world meter and from the economists. Here we have uh, um, six countries, no, seven countries, I'm sorry, uh, their population, uh, the number of tests per million inhabitants. As you can see, US is not the country that has tested more extensively uh, in terms of either relative to the population as a toll or relative to the case detected. Okay? Uh, Denmark uh, and UK have tested more extensively than, um, than the United States. This is the number of cases per million the United States has about 15,000 cases per million inhabitants, followed by Sweden and then by UK and then by Germany. But these are the, this is important. These are the death rates, okay? Apart from the United Kingdom, that has had 683 deaths per million inhabitants, Sweden comes second. These two countries, the UK started with herd immunity, then they stopped, but Sweden has more or less continued with a firm policy. And these death rates are much higher than those of comparable countries, such as Germany, Denmark, and Norway. Actually, the death rate in Sweden is more than 10 times the death rate in Norway. And actually the Swedish death rate uh, was much, much higher than the US until recently. Now the death rates in the United States, uh, you know, more people die, catching up with Sweden. 
And the argument for herd immunity was that, oh, the, the economy would be protected. Well, according to the economists, uh, the protection conferred by the herd immunity policy of Sweden has not been better than that of Denmark uh, or Norway or even the US. Uh, so, so there have been really not big impacts in terms of protecting the national gross product by using herd immunity. But if you compare the death rate in Sweden with the death rate in the US and you translate that into the population size of the US, if the US had done that herd immunity policy, as of today, there would, have, there would be about 28,000 more deaths in the US than now, which is about 50% of the Vietnam War casualties. Okay, and uh, what we did to complete the statistical treatment is uh, uh, there is a relationship which I showed at the beginning where the proportion of the population that needs to be infected at equilibrium is one minus the reciprocal of R. Now, since R has a posterior gamma distribution, it follows that R minus one has an inverse gamma distribution. And from this posterior distribution, you can readily derive the posterior distribution of the proportion of the population that needs to be infected in order to get herd immunity. And of course, to be a, a, a reasonable distribution has to be bounded between zero and one because this is a proportion that cannot exceed one and cannot be smaller than zero. So I use uh, this approach in the context of Uruguay to estimate how many people would be expected to be dead if Uruguay had followed the herd immunity policy uh, in an unrestricted manner. So these are um, um, death rates by age for various countries. And from these, I made the following assumptions. I assume that uh, Ur Uruguay is a fairly uh, demographically old country. So uh, we assume that the percent of people younger than 65 is 85%, and they would die at, a, let's say, at a 1%. Perhaps this is a bit too high, but uh, it's not unreasonable. And the death rate for older than 65 uh, will be 15%, which is not unreasonable either, based on the data that we got from France, for example. So under these assumptions, and using the posterior distribution of P Crete, I can arrive at the posterior distribution of the expected number of deaths for six South American countries, Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Cuba, Peru, and Uruguay. Now, because you need to, in order to de define uh, the epidemiological policy, you have to estimate R at the onset. And I did this for days eight and 14 of the epidemics. So let's take Brazil, for example. If we had estimated R at day eight, there was tremendous statistical uncertainty. Uh, but if you use the posterior distribution at day 14, roughly uh, about from, let's say, 50 to 80% of the population uh, of Brazil will need to be infected in order to reach herd immunity. In the case of Uruguay, again, because of the statistical volatility, if you had used the, the R, the posterior distribution for R at day eight, we would need about 70% of the population to be infected, whereas for day 14, it would have been much lower. So there is a tremendous amount of statistical uncertainty about what the choice of a policy should we go for herd immunity simply because at the early stage of the epidemics, uh, there, there is much volatility. And these are the distribution of death for the case of Uruguay. For example, let's take the red curves of date eight. Uh, the number of deaths in Uruguay by adopting a herd immunity without doing nothing whatsoever would have probably been around 18,000. 
uh, in young people and maybe about 47,000 in older people. And this is based on day 14, much lower number of that, but still quite a few thousand, from 1,000 to 6,000, from 500 to 20,000. So these are uh, statistical games, so to speak, but it's another way in which you can supplement the information that comes from this uh, Bayesian approach based strictly on number of cases, as simple as it gets. Uh, I didn't use number of deaths simply because in Uruguay we haven't had many deaths. Since the epidemic started, I think there have been a grand total of 36 deaths in Uruguay. Unfortunately, the same cannot be said about Brazil. Um, now, do the number of cases and per million inhabitants tell us really how much infection is going on? Actually, no. Uh, because there are many asymptomatics and there is, of course, a certain bias, as many people do not get tested and they are carrying the virus. So this is what antibodies can do. You draw a sample from persons and uh, some will be infected, some will not be infected. And then you estimate the proportion uh, having antibodies in the blood and that's called the zero prevalence. And what we know as of today, I, I really have not been following this literature closely enough, but based on what I have read uh, and in my recollection, in many studies in different countries, as of today, August 6, 2020, the percent of the population that is seropositive is from 2 to 30%. So the march towards herd immunity uh, has been very slow hopefully because of social distancing, but the, the percent, the, the, the ratio of people infected to the number of persons detected with COVID-19 has been uh, found to be at least 10 in the case of the United States. Okay, now let's put, this was uh, taken from the New York Times uh, a couple of months ago. Let's put the risk of COVID-19 in perspective. David Roberts uh, is a physicist. And what he did is he measured the chance of dying uh, due to different, doing different things using micromorts. One micromort is one in one million chances that you are going to die in a given day. So let's say that you start your day tomorrow at breakfast with a uh, Globo, Folia de Sao Paulo, or the New York Times, uh, at that point at breakfast, you have one micromort risk of dying. If you decide to have surgery, uh, let's say plastic surgery, and uh, but you're going to have general anesthesia, that adds five micromorts. So I, I you suggest you don't do surgery unless it's strictly necessary. If you decide to have fun, and uh, go to an airplane and just jump in a parachute, that will add seven micromorts, but that's per jump. So if you jump four times, at the end of the jumping, if you are still alive, uh, you have added 28 micromorts uh, of chances of dying. If you are a motorcyclist and you drive 70 kilometers every day, you have 11 micromorts of dying in any given day. So I don't know if this is more dangerous than running the subway uh, or a bus or driving, uh, but I suspect it is. If you uh, decided to join the army or the US army and, and uh, go to Afghanistan in 2010, you had 25 micromorts of dying on any given day. If you... Uh, are expecting a baby, I'm assuming that, that we are speaking about females, uh, the chances of dying uh, during giving a birth is 210 micromorts. If you go to Himalaya and try to climb it, to climb more than 8,000 meters, then you have 10,000 micromorts. If you live in Michigan during the epidemics, that adds 11 micromorts. If you lived in New York at the time that the epidemics were, was as big, you will have 15, 50 microns. And if you live in New York and you are old and you pick up COVID, that is 
slightly less risky than having been a pilot during the Second World War and go to Germany and bombing in four missions. So uh, use this data, um, uh, adapt it to your own personal perspective and, and see uh, what chances you're willing to take. Now I'm getting to the end. Uh, so is uh, what happened in Uruguay a miracle? Um, well, for those of you that uh, like football, and uh, I'm sorry for the Brazilians because I need to use this metaphor. Uh, there was a famous uh, final of the World Cup in 1950 in the Maracanã Stadium in Brazil, which is considered a miracle. I, I personally think it was, it was a, a very, very unlikely event that Uruguay will defeat Brazil two to one in 1950, but it happened. It's a, it's a landmark in the history of soccer. So are you are we seeing a maracana of the pandemic here or not? Well, this uh, let me remind you, this is the Uruguayan team that won the World Cup in 1950. The first goal, Brazil started winning 1-0. to zero. Then uh, Juan Alberto Schiaffino uh, tied up the game. And then Gigia made the second goal and the Uruguay was victorious. And this was the captain of Uruguay, Obdulio Varela. So are we, this was, you know, I, th I think an objective observer of football will say that, that that was close to a miracle. So is what's happening in Uruguay a miracle or not? Well, let's think the Uruguayan epidemic started around March 13, March 14. At that time, the entire world knew that there was something going on. Uh, we would see the scenes in Italy and Spain that touch us very specially because most of us are descendants of Italian and Spanish, and Germans too. Um, so we would know that it would arrive. And the government didn't waste time and they uh, prepared themselves in terms of professional, pro professional protective equipment in terms of intensive care units, in terms of the public health infrastructure. Uh, Uruguay is lucky, it's not a hub. Uh, we don't get any flights in Montevideo, not many. Contrary to Milan, Frankfurt, New York City, Los Angeles, Munich. So that was of course very helpful. Then Uruguay has a low demographic density. Uh, so there are some parts of the country in which uh, the virus doesn't have a great deal of success in transmitting, like in Montana in the United States. Uh, but we do have, of course, an older population. So this was a, a matter of great concern. But we do have a low demographic density. Then uh, the government had uh, uh, took very rapid action, very decidedly, and with great political leadership. I think. Uh, the, the actions of the Uruguayan president have been praised uh, by the international press, and I, I think it would be unfair not to make that comment. Uh, the government decided to support the use of database evidence and scientific advice. They actually named a group of three distinguished scientists that, of course, gave the general guidelines, but behind them, there was a small battalion of scientists, including statisticians and medical doctors. So this is a, it was a remarkable use of the local talent, talent in science. Um, we were lucky because uh, our outbreaks were kind of small. There were very few small fires as opposed to huge outbreaks, and they have been controlled so far. Uh, we have a highly effective testing system and the tracing uh, because of the low number of cases is effective, fast and accurate. But there are some things that must be said. Um, Uruguay has a very good public health system. We have a structured health system and everybody is covered. Everybody goes to a doctor, everybody has health care and this has helped. Also, something that is peculiar in Uruguay does not exist in the United States is that um, there are many 
private systems and public systems, and it's highly encouraged, um, that if you are sick, you call them and they come home. So this pressure is useful for older people. Uh, so the doctor come home, the see older people, the ambulances come, and, uh, and there is a, an excellent uh, access to primary health care, even if you, you don't have to go to a hospital. Here in the United States, if you call the ambulance, then you'll get a bill for you know, $1,500, something like that. So men, most people drive to emergency rooms. Then uh, again, football comes into the picture. Uh, one of the three scientists leading the scientific advice, Dr. Ravi, uh, used the metaphor of playing a football game against Bolivia in La Paz. If you do not know about soccer, football, uh, in La Paz, you are playing at 4,000 meters it's really, really difficult to play. The, the ball, you know, you kick the ball and goes up, uh, you don't have oxygen, and playing against Bolivia is really, really tough. So he said, we should uh, look at the epidemics as playing in La Paz. They are going zero, zero at times in which Bolivia is pushing hard. And that was understood immediately by, um, the, the, the Uruguayan population. Then there was political consensus on health matter. There was no right left ideological stupidity that we see every day here because of the proximity of the elections uh, in November. So that fortunately did not happen in Uruguay. So at the end, uh, was it a miracle or it was not? No, it was not a miracle, but there was another fact. The Uruguayans faced the epidemic with what is called the Garra Charrua. Uh, that means never give up. And that's what the Uruguayans defeated Brazil to the one in 1950. Finally, and I'm sorry it took me much longer than, than I thought, I would like to read you um, a statement by Richard Horton. He is the editor of the Lancet, the famous medical publication, which goes as follows. We surely have to use this occasion to resist and challenge the past move for estrangement and prejudice. We have to use this time for solidarity, for mutual respect and concern. My health depends on your health. Your health depends on my health. We cannot escape one another. The liberties we prize so highly depend on the health of all of us. We cannot say that the politics and priorities of my country are of no concern to you. They are, and legitimately so. Just as the politics and priorities of your country are a legitimate concern of mine. Sovereignty is dead. So um, friends and colleagues, thank you very much for joining me uh, in this event. I apologize, I went like 20 minutes over time. Um, I hope you found this presentation informative. And of course, I'll try to address questions if any. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Janala. Uh, we've got a few questions already. So Fernando Aguate uh, asks uh, about your opinion on how close you guys are to herd Im immunity in the US. Um, I most probably we are far away from immunity because uh, the I, I have not seen recent zero prevalence, but the, uh, I recall a study that was done about a month ago in Manhattan, where I think the number of the percent of persons with um, positive titles of antibodies was 20%. Based on the R of the United States, uh, which I have not examined in recent days, uh, I, I would guess that at least 50% of the population would need to be infected. So I think we are far from that. Perfect. Uh, there is another question uh, mentioning a few events in the past, like cross herd uh, immunity uh, was developed in Southeast Asia because of past exposure to the SARS virus. And then same thing regarding Mars, uh, past exposure in Middle East. Uh, can you 
please comment on that about the, the cross herd immunity. Well, um, this is an area under uh, scrutiny by uh, by science. Um, the, um, there have been also speculation that the famous uh, BCG vaccine that we used to get when we were children um, confers some degree of protection with COVID-19. And there's also been some speculation that the oral polio vaccine uh, I'm, I'm trying to find the, the the screen here. I lost it. I don't know what I did. Okay. Um, uh, there has been some speculation that it confers some protection. Now, the this idea that in Southeast Asia, specifically Vietnam and Myanmar and possibly Cambodia, I have not looked at the Cambodian data, um, that it's, it's just a conjecture. Uh, and the conjecture is based that this is a region populated by many types of different coronaviruses, which perhaps uh, have produced immunological reactions that are similar to uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2, uh, but it's, it's far from being clear. We've got one, one other question asking you to comment about the epidemiological approach of using wastewater to control coronavirus. To using? Uh, wastewater to control uh, the coronavirus. What, what you mean by control is to, is to measure the prevalence, right? Uh, probably, yes. Yes, well, uh, this, this is being done, I think has been done in the Netherlands, and I think has been done in some Middle Eastern countries. And, and there is evidence that, that um, there are, I think in the, in the waste waters, they find traces, molecular traces of the virus, and that can be used to indirectly estimate the prevalence. Uh, so it, it is, of course, a part of the toolkit that should be considered. Now, how important it has been uh, in this particular context, I, I truly do not know. Okay. We've got several notes thanking you so much for the great talk. Uh, this is actually one of the first times I've seen something like this. People are really, really excited about uh, your presentation. There are some notes here about saying that Brazilians forgot about the 2-1 from, from Uruguay back in the 50s. So some of the Brazilians were a little bit sad with that reminder, uh, but everybody is, is quite happy about it. Uh, so Josemar, Professor Josemar, Josemar is asking you, how do you choose the parameters for your gamma distribution for your gamma prior? Yes, like most Bayesians do, you bring them out of the blue. <laughs> but but uh, um, of course, uh, uh, the, the way out of it is to say, well, you do some sensitivity analysis and change A and B, etc. And then you see how much the inferences change. And I'm, I'm sure that in the case of Uruguay, this uh, Prior hyperparameters are very influential, but in the U.S. or Brazil, they're probably less so. Uh, but let me let me comment uh, something. I think it's important to maintain a good relationship between Uruguayans and Brazilians. I I can assure you that uh, in the final uh, between uh, uh, in, in 1950 had been between Argentina and Uruguay, I would have been much much harder. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, Professor Janal, I, I just want to, to thank you very much for taking the time and all the, the preparation to have this talk uh, for us. I would like to also to thank everyone who has been sitting here and attending your talk. We have participants from uh, Canada, United States, Brazil, uh, Melbourne. We've got I think Germany as well. So thank you all very much for your participation. I would like to to do a disclaimer here uh, that next week, if you guys are able to come back online uh, at the same time next week on the 13th, 
You're going to have Rafael Rizari from Harvard University. And on the 24th, eventually, on this particular day, it, uh, it's going to be a Monday, although we are usually meeting on, on Thursdays. But on the 24th, we are also going to have Francesca Dominici from Harvard. Uh, Rafael is going to talk, he's going to talk about the excess mortality uh, on different uh, country situations. And Francesca is going to talk a little bit about the effects and association between pollution and COVID-19 cases. So with this, I would like to thank you all for participating once more on our series of webinars. And I'd like to thank very much Professor Janola for having the time to talk to us. It was a great addition to our collection. Thank you very much for being here today. Thank you very much. Very well, nice evening. Thank you, everybody. Bye, just Janola. stay safe. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, Mariana. Bye-bye. See you soon. Hope so. Get well. Be safe. You too. Take care.